Hey, good morning. Tuesday, December 12th. Cold. I mean, really cold. Riding shotgun with Tupper. We're just going back, exploring on the farm. I've got my dog running along <laughs> like a crazy dog today. Uh, I feel sorry. I just threw hay to the horses and I... I don't feel sorry for him when it's cold. I don't feel sorry for him when it's windy, but I feel sorry for him when it's cold and windy. And I wouldn't want to be a, I wouldn't want to be one of them today, although they, they've all kind of got their winter coats grown in. Uh, but um, I'll be headed over to Champaign in a little bit. Brad Underwood today and Lou Henson today. We'll talk about uh, both of those guys in a minute. But um, uh, also we're waiting today to get some... Um, clarity on the injury to Leron Black. Uh, Leron was hurt um, in the first half of the game Saturday at UNLV and um, uh, really was a non-factor in the game. Played 12 minutes at two points. He's their leading scorer so that's significant and um, got his arm uh, Brad said his arm pinned, whatever that means hyperextended elbow and arm and um they did the MRI yesterday, I, and I think they were just waiting for the doctors to interpret everything and say, okay, here's what it looks like. And uh, I'm expecting him to be out for at least a little bit. Um, it would be great if, if it was less than a little bit, but um, I expect they'll have to go a little bit without him. And, and it's, uh, you know, they're not exactly flush along the front line anyhow. They've so it's going to be Kipper, and it's going to be uh, Michael Finke, and uh, and and Greggy Boydbaden, uh, who's going to have to come in and play more now. He played uh, 10 minutes the other day. You know, he's really raw. Um, I think he's got some really nice potential. I think he will he will develop into something um, that you look at from time to time and go, wow, that's that was quite a play he made. Um, I think it'll come on the defensive end most of all. Um, but um, he's going to have to help now. They need size. They're short on size, and and um, he can rebound a little bit. He can block shots a little bit. Um, I think he's he gets a little panicky when the ball's in his hand. You saw that the other day when he missed like what he missed three from oh a half a foot. <laughs> and um, but they're going to have to um, go for at least a little bit. He didn't practice yesterday. I assume he won't play. Wednesday against Longwood, they should not need him in that game. Uh, but then they go to Chicago and play New Mexico. And then a week later, on the 23rd of December, they are down in St. Louis for the Bragging Rights game against Missouri. And what this team needs is they need a signature win. And what they have is four close calls that are kind of signature losses, you know. A, a couple less mistakes, um, maybe an extra basket, maybe a, you know, and obviously in the UNLV game. Uh, fewer fouls um, and they could win any of those games all of those games two of those games one of those games um, but they didn't win any of them and um, it's partly because they're young and make mistakes it's partly because even their veteran players don't have much experience winning close games and um, but I liked some of the things that um, happened in that game late Saturday night uh, in Vegas I mean it was wonderful to see Mark Smith start to feel good about himself again. I think he was really down on himself after going through a bit of a slump and um, hit four out of five from three and lead them with 17 points. That was terrific. And then um, uh, Trent Frazier, I thought, played really well. And, you know, he gets going a little fast sometimes, and uh, but but he got his shot going a little bit, and his quickness is, is a weapon. It is going to be interesting to see how the D – division of minutes goes here at that point guard spot um, and you know what at the pace they want to play um, you know the minutes everybody's going to get minutes so that's not really an issue but you know we start out the season with Tijon Lucas um, the favored son in that role and right now I'm not so sure I think I think Brad would be inclined to play Trent even more if they could get him to um you know, maybe cut turnovers just a little bit. The problem with Tijon is Tijon can give you defense, and that's good. And and Tijon can make passes, and that's good. And Tijon can finish drives better than he did a year ago, and that's good. But he doesn't give you the um, presentation of a 
of a jump shot you have to worry about and from two or three occasionally he'll make one he knows he has to take them when he's wide open at times but you feel a lot more um, like the ball might go in the hole when it's Trent Frazier taking him or when it's um, Mark Smith taking him or even lately I think we're starting to feel a little more confident with DeMonte Williams taking him and um, you know I the lineup they played the other day uh, at parts of the second half. I mean, when they're going toe to toe with a team that has a really good seven foot center, they're playing, you know, Kipper in the middle, um, and then um, Aaron Jordan at the four, and and Aaron Jordan's a guard, and those and then three other guards. So basically, they're playing four guards and a six foot six a guy that you're calling your post guy, uh, or Finky would come in and then they would play him, but. Um, it was, a, it was it was tough the other day, and, um, <clears throat> and yet it was an interesting game. It was a frustrating game to watch because of ESPN's uh, broadcast I thought was horrific. Uh, they did not acknowledge Laron's injury. They didn't make any kind of... That has to be a big deal. When the other team loses their leading score, that's a big deal. They don't mention it. Then they get caught up in the ridiculously long Kareem Abdul-Jabbar interview. Um, hey, I'm a Kareem fan, and I... I'm interested in what he has to say, but you don't suspend your interest in the game and, and just make it an afterthought so he can promote a book and talk around for a while. You know, if it's that important, then do it at halftime. Give him the entire halftime. Uh, or do put him on a separate show. I don't know what you want to do there, but, um, I, you know, he's a great man and a great player and, and all that, but that was just, that was insulting to people who cared about the game. And that's why people tuned into their broadcast, and it annoyed the hell out of me. Um, but um, uh, a worthwhile trip out there. Um, and then they have this weird rule now, you know, with NCAA time management rules. They had to get a waiver from the NCAA in order to practice, um, in order to, to deal with their travel day. So, so they after the game ended, they went back to their hotel. They slept for a few hours. They got up early, they got on their flight. They landed in Champaign at 2.30 in the afternoon on Sunday. The NCAA said, okay, that's fine, but you have to give them now 26 hours off with no basketball-related activities before you can practice. So practice began at 4.30 Monday afternoon, very brief practice because Brad had to get ready for his weekly radio show, which is an obligation he's got to keep, and that starts at 7, and so he's got to head over there at 6.30 and get out of his practice shorts or whatever. So anyhow, um, that's fine. Um, they'll get ready for Longwood. That shouldn't take a lot of preparation, um, and they'll win that game, and then they go to Chicago on Saturday. Now that brings us to Lou Henson because Saturday's game is against New Mexico State. Lou coached uh, head coach at both schools, Illinois and New Mexico State, took both schools to the Final Four, um, beloved at both schools, and um, and so I'm looking forward to seeing Lou today. I haven't seen him in, oh, f several weeks, um, some during football season, but um, and he's been in the hospital here lately, and um, I'm assuming Mary will be with him. I hope so, um, and, um, you know, Lou's a guy... Those of us who covered them for a long time really appreciate Lou. Um, I know I do um, on a personal level and a and a professional level. And uh, I think my admiration for him, and I think I speak for a lot of people when I say this, I think my admiration for him has grown um, in recent years as he has battled his illness. And, um, and it's been a serious illness, uh, at times life-threatening illness. And he's done it with such vigor and uh, composure and dignity that when you watch him do it and go through it you realize you know this is this is the same fight that he used to ask from his teams and um, you know and lo and behold he's delivering it now um, at the most important juncture of his life so um, I think a lot of people just respect him for that and also for the loyalty he's shown to the University of Illinois. And you know what? They feel the same way in Las Cruces because of the loyalty he's shown to New Mexico State. They have leaned on him in very recent years uh, as a, if you want to call it a consultant, uh, for counsel, for advice, um, uh, 
both in terms of choosing coaches and athletic directors, and uh, Lou has a, a great deal of, um, of compassion for that school and um, cares a lot about them too. And so uh, he maintains homes in each, each community, and um, so it'll be good to see him today. And hopefully he continues to feel well enough to be up there on Saturday. I know their whole family, uh, they have in the teens, I think somebody said maybe 13 or something, um, family members planning to be there. And then they were going to travel from Chicago to Champaign. This is what I heard a month ago. Uh, back to Champaign and have their family Christmas celebration at Lou and Mary's house um, in Champaign following that game. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing Lou today um, and looking forward to, uh, you know, Brad's just so good for us in the media because he talks, he explains, he, um, he loves talking about his players. You know, some coaches, uh, not to drop any names, but some coaches don't like to tell you anything and don't like to talk about their players and don't want to share any information and don't want to explain why they did what they did and how it transpired. And Brad loves to talk about that stuff. And so by the time you have a 30-minute session with Brad Underwood, you feel like you know a whole lot more. He's cared enough to explain it to you and and chosen to do it. Not every coach does, I get it, but I sure appreciate those that do. And um, and so um, I always walk out of there, you know, you walk out of all these things hoping that you've got one good story and delighted if you have two. And with Brad, you usually walk out of there and, you know, if, if pushed on it, you could probably write four. And, um, and then we'll get to talk to players right before the start of practice too and probably watch the first half hour of practice. Um, as they begin prep for, for Longwood. Um, so um, uh, the other thing that happened this morning um, that I just feel compelled to mention is that Devin Hester retired, announced his retirement. And uh, uh, Devin, of course, was with the Bears for a long time, and he's one of Lovey's favorite guys. So Lovey lights up when he talks about some of his guys. Um, I've seen him light up when he's talked about Brian Urlacher and when he's talked about Charles Tillman and when he talks about Devin Hester. And for good reason, because I think Devin Hester was one of the most exciting players I've ever seen in my life of watching football. Um, you know, he played a position where he didn't get a chance to excite you as often as Walter Payton did, or Dick Butkus did, or or Brian Urlacher did. But um, when, when there were punts and there were kickoffs, and occasionally when he would line up at wide receiver, uh, there were moments there where you just came out of your seat and you were like, oh my God. <laughs> That was unbelievable. And, you know, unfortunately, and I understand why, but, you know, unfortunately they've taken the kickoff out of pro football for the most part. And um, there's just not a lot of guys like that. I was, I told Lovey one of the first times I ever talked to him in his role as the Illinois head coach that, you know, Lovey, I hope, I wish for you that in your recruiting uh, ventures you'll find the next Devin Hester. And he said, I can promise you I'll look for him every day. Uh, but he said those guys – are just so rare and I thought there must be more of them out there and and I'm I'm sure there's some that approximate but I've never seen anybody like that guy that guy was man he was unbelievable and uh, I didn't do it this morning because I wanted to get out here and do this and I've got to run into the office and then get to champagne but later tonight uh, I will do what I suggest you do and that's go to YouTube and and just dial up Devin Hester highlights and oh my goodness what a what a joy he was to watch and and um you know i hear he's doing well and um i did talk to lovey about him last year ironically and lovey says you know i mean he he uh, looks forward to the day when he'll go to canton and, and uh, hopefully see him um, um enshrined in the hall of fame and um, certainly at his position in my opinion the best there ever was um hey listen thanks for riding along I uh, appreciate it a lot. Uh, December 12th. It's getting close. I've got the Christmas spirit now. I'm, I'm getting geeked up. Um, I don't have a tree in the truck, but uh, <laughs> I'm getting getting pretty excited about it. Um, maybe see some of you over at the game uh, Wednesday night or some in Chicago and then some down in St. Louis. Um, you know, be cool. A signature win would be that bragging rights game. Uh, Wednesday night won't count as one. Even New Mexico State won't count as one. But if Illinois were to beat Missouri, um, that would count as one. And uh, we'll see. I don't, I don't rule that out, but um, I think they probably need LaRon Black to do that. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Talk to you next time.